Hello everyone, this is Dr. Sean Tanger. I'm an assistant professor here at Mississippi State University housed in the Coastal Research and Extension Center uh, in Biloxi, Mississippi. Uh, today I'm here to give you a virtual presentation for our advisory uh, producer council. Um, I know I uh, just had started last uh, in 2019 uh, when we had had our meeting in February of 2020, so I didn't have very many months uh, on the job, but uh, now with a full year, albeit an atypical year um, in our rear view, I have uh, quite a bit of uh, material, both extension and research uh, that I'd like to go over with you. Uh, so, uh, several, several of which uh, projects uh, directly uh, answer some of the needs and requests uh, made at the last advisory council meeting. So you can see here uh, a br brief overview of my extension and applied research programs. Now, formally, I don't have an applied research program, uh, but in order to really feed extension specific to the needs of clientele groups, both at the region and the state level, uh, there's really a, a, an, an absolute need, as far as I see it, to do research that I can then extend to the public uh, forestry stakeholders as well as anyone else that it may be relevant to. But you can see here just a brief overview of the, of the, uh, the topics. And we'll get into each of these uh, here throughout the rest of the presentation. So my number one uh, responsibility for I MSU has been taking over the timber taxation uh, statewide program. Timber taxation routinely uh, ranks number one for National Woodland Owner Survey's uh, most requested subject matter. Uh, it's also a topic area that, strangely enough, there is very little expertise in throughout the United States. I'm one of maybe five uh, that would classify themselves as a timber taxation expert, and I would use the term expert uh, very, uh, you know, very loosely uh, in, in this case. Uh, most of the training that people get uh, is, is, is self-taught um, and talking with others who, who do these sorts of programs. But uh, nonetheless, there's still quite a bit of uh, educational value that I can bring, despite not being a CPA or a, a tax attorney. There, there's quite a bit of information that I can distill down for the landowner, a forest landowner, to make sure that they are aware of uh, the major broad strokes in timber taxation, things that they can take advantage of, things to avoid. You can see just a little bit of my output here on this slide. Uh, obviously, with uh, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, atypical year that we had, um, I'm referring to COVID-19, it, uh, it was a real challenge to get in front of people and to do programming and to get a lot of the questions, kind of the trial by fire that, that one would get an extension to figure out, hey, am, am I teaching them correctly? Are the points getting across? Am I covering the appropriate material? We're able to do some of that through phone, phone calls, emails, uh, uh, individual site visits, things like that. But we really, really gummed up the works having the, uh, you know, the COVID-19 restrictions. Now, those the safety reasons, uh, certainly, and, and we have to adhere to those. Uh, so one way I tried to get around it, as did most of my colleagues, was to uh, uh, share presentations online. So using virtual materials such as recordings that we uh, posted on YouTube and Facebook, as well as live webinars uh, where we could get some questions. The problem for a lot of forestry landowners is the populations typically older. Um, they can do online stuff, right? We, we all have email and you can uh, navigate a computer, but the point is, is they don't prefer it. And so it's been still a little bit of a challenge in, in getting this material across. And hopefully this year, 2021, we'll be able to get back into the normal swing of things and get in front of people and uh, kind of have that camaraderie and that togetherness that, that we get uh, with the traditional in-person meetings. But these are uh, a powerful way to reach audiences that we may not typically uh, deal with. Um, as you can see, uh, I I formed a program, Timber Tax Mississippi, and really that was just to kind of put a brand on the taxation presentations that I was doing as they pertain to a Mississippi audience. Now, much of the material is can be 
broader beyond that southeast because we look at pine plantations in a lot of cases or even nationwide because we are dealing with a lot of federal tax uh, uh, issues and, and topics. Um, you can see there though on the uh, right hand side that Timber Tax Mississippi, we have those on uh, YouTube. So if you want to find all of those videos, I would just go into a YouTube search and do Timber Tax MS and all of those presentations will come up. So that's probably the quickest way for you to, to access all of those. Uh, we also hosted those videos um, as well as a, a couple of others on Facebook. And if you'll notice, there's been kind of a, a theme um, uh, of storm damage timber with all the uh, hurricane and tornado damage that we had last year. We, I, I fielded a lot of questions, individual questions, as well as group questions uh, on you know, how to deal with that from a, a tax standpoint, as, as well as from a management standpoint in some cases. Uh, we also published uh, a, an extension publication paying for a new forest without cost share funding. Uh, that was an old document, but there have been so many updates to cost sharing and the tax categories uh, uh, that people are in that it really had to be redone uh, to, to kind of update all the, all the math or I should say all the accounting that was in that document. So if you want something that's a little bit more current, um, we've now updated that and uh, done a little bit of rewriting, not, not a whole lot. It, was, it wasn't a lot, a lot that really needed changing, but um, I think that document might be of, of interest to some people. Basically what we're trying to get across there as it pertains to timber taxation is with the Mississippi Reforestation Tax Credit in fact, you see uh, a very comparable and sometimes uh, preferred uh, uh, benefits, tax outcomes, as far as financial outcomes, using the uh, federal and state uh, Mississippi tax, uh, I don't want to say loopholes, but uh, advantages, uh, as opposed to using cost sharing, which brings with it further complications to your uh, tax filing. Uh, so going forward, what are we going to be doing on, on taxation? Uh, well, I've got some more stuff on differences in tax brackets that I'd like to cover as it pertains to uh, cost share and just general uh, reforestation tax credit things. Uh, there, it's, it's really, as you might imagine, there's really a lot of nuance and complication to it. So uh, we're, we're trying to dig into that a little bit more for you as, a, as both applied research and, and extension uh, publications that can be utilized by uh, forest landowners and, and forestry consultants to help uh, uh, guide forest landowners with respect to taxes. Uh, we'll be doing more of our traditional in-person tax workshops covering, you know, the typical topics of basis and expenses and, and declaring income and reforestation and casualty and non-casualty losses. We'll also have to keep doing virtual material as, as we're still under a 10-person max uh, uh, in person for, for extension events, which really is, is limiting. And uh, unless I'm doing something within the southeastern region, it really isn't, uh, isn't appropriate to drive five hours uh, to North Mississippi to, to teach, you know, between seven and, and 10 people. Uh, we want to try to utilize those virtual materials to do that. Uh, you can see over to the right hand side there, though, right, how, how important it is, you know, just, just something as simple as understanding the difference between capital gains and ordinary income rates as they apply to timber uh, and the rules therein, those internal rates of return and, and what we call net present value, which is just a, a financial calculation to determine the, uh, the uh, uh, whether or not a, a project is worth taking on given, my, given all of my, my factors. Um, and as you can see, the, the capital, if you apply the capital gains rate, that investment is far, far advantageous to the one using ordinary income. So taxation for timber products, you got a slow growing product. You only get revenue every so often. There's a lot of planning, a lot of uh, uh, calculating that goes into that and taxes uh, play a huge role. And so we want to continue to try to merge a landowner's knowledge of management and things like fertilization and maybe uh, 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 thinning regimes, things like that, but also under the auspices of how are the taxes going to be interrelated with this. Uh, lastly, 
I'll be covering uh, some estate planning training. I'm, I'm again, as I said, I have to learn most of this stuff myself. So I'll be covering estate planning in the in the coming years. But of course, first I have to learn it before I can teach it. And uh, estate planning is even more tricky uh, than than uh, regular taxation because you're dealing with a lot more legal code as, instead of just uh, tax regulations. So there's more, generally more interpretation that can go on there and things just can get more complicated when you're talking about uh, handing down property to three or four kids that uh, may also have kids of their own. And one of the, one of the kids dies and then what are the, how do the grandkids factor in? Uh, estate planning can get very complicated very quickly and you can really see your, uh, your investment in timberland evaporate if you don't plan uh, appropriately. Uh, here, here was a, a quote from the last advisory council you can see there on the left. Uh, luckily for me, timber markets is, is really my specialty. That's where I started. That's my uh, most background I have. The taxes have kind of come, come as a, a result of the job. But uh, producers get, uh, certainly are worried about loss of access to markets and how that affects their investment in their timberland. And of course it does. You know, when we try to look at whether or not somebody can harvest pulpwood or if they would have to pay for pulpwood to get it harvested, or, or what if I don't really have good saw timber markets? Should I just cut chip and saw? All of those things are kind of interacting and, and showing uh, uh, different outcomes for the forest landowner in terms of uh, uh, financial returns. And of course, you know, uh, as timber markets have fragmented uh, and there's not as many options within each market that you operate in, then certainly your timber management is going to have to be, uh, it's going to have to be a little more niche than it used to be. You can't just do it like, like everybody was told to do it before, right? Uh, two thinnings and a final harvest and boom, this, this thing's over with. Now we really have to take into consideration the fact that these markets uh, from one 50 mile radius to another can, can vary quite a bit. Uh, one document I'm working on now is foregoing my timber, timber harvest for one year. A lot of times landowners wanna know, well, what if prices go up by X amount next year? Should I wait or should I go ahead and harvest? Well, that document, it's not finished yet. It's getting, it's approaching uh, being finished in probably another week. It will allow you to uh, look at a formula in order to better make those determinations or at least to understand better what factors go into determining that. Um, there are uh, more brute force methods where we just go in and run a million scenarios, but those, those you know, because there's a million scenarios that can be tight, quite time consuming, this will allow the landowner to, to bypass a lot of that kind of trial and error to see what do prices need to be for my investment to, to be improved. It's also another way for you to look at, uh, there, there, there are rumors that there are programs in the, in the works for uh, carbon uh, credits. So basically rentals for carbon sequestration on forest land. So instead of the typical year that you would harvest, you postpone that for a year or two or longer, and you would contract each individual year in order to do so. And I'll have more information on that program uh, throughout this year as it comes up, um, if, it, if it comes to fruition. Right now, it's still, it's still in the, uh, the, uh, the formation stage. Uh, lastly there, well not lastly, uh, next we have an article in Tree Talk that's forthcoming. Uh, this is an article with uh, Dr. Eric McConnell, uh, Mark Mazels, Dr. John Owl, and myself looking at the impact of the new sawmills in the state, both economically as well as the harvest that we're, that we're uh, looking to in increase. Um, the, if you include all five of the, the new sawmills that have been announced, we're talking about a really dramatic increase uh, in terms of the overall tonnage uh, of saw timber that will be harvested in the coming years. So while this won't solve our problems in terms of prices right away, obviously before prices go up, harvest has to go up. And so this will be a good first step in that. And these, these mills are, are uh, stationed throughout the state. Um, so from north to south, there's a good mix in terms of where these uh, sites are locating and it does look like there are still uh, there is still interest from companies uh, to announce either an additional 
mill or for new companies to announce a mill. So I expect that the uh, recent good news that we've had in terms of sawmilling anyway, uh, is going to continue. Uh, Mississippi, if you look at the growth and yield outcomes, there were second to none in terms of saw timber growth, uh, saw timber inventory currently, and that's not expected to change anytime soon. The downside to that is because it's not expected to change very much uh, anytime soon, uh, the prices aren't expected to be, be uh, changed dramatically. Uh, recently, uh, getting ready to submit a, a publication for us to mill price trends and relationships for Mississippi. Um, and that's across pulpwood, uh, uh, saw timber, both pine and hardwoods, where we're generally looking at the, the trends and volatility in those products. And, and to kind of keep a, a long story short, as you've seen, uh, most likely as a landowner, what we've seen is uh, uh, volatility in, in pine saw timber has increased dramatically along with pulpwoods to a, a little bit lesser degree. And uh, in terms of, you know, what you've, what you would have made money investing in over the last 20 years, it's, it's really hardwood uh, saw timber. But kind of going back to a lot of the things I've said on this slide, the real crux there is pulpwood. What are we going to do there? There's not a lot of mill, there's not mill announcements for pulpwood. We do have the Pascagoula uh, mill uh, with the, uh, the pellets over, over in Pascagoula area, and they may be uh, interested in, in putting in an additional mill somewhere. But uh, where are we going to come up with the new demand for this pulpwood class product? As you've seen, the state prices for pulpwood range anywhere from $1.50 to $4. Um, and it's just really, even if you can get that price, it's hard to find someone to come to conduct the harvest. So we're going to have to figure out both as, as timberland stakeholders and an extension group here, uh, as well as all the other stakeholders uh, for timber in the state, how to solve that problem because ultimately uh, you really you really are going to have to drastically change how you grow your trees if you either can't harvest pulpwood or have to pay for pulpwood. The, the way we look at forest management may have to change a bit. And, and certainly this is true in hardwoods as well with all the shutdowns like we saw in Port Hudson uh, in South Arkansas. These were really giant uh, hardwood pulpwood mills, and now they're they're done permanently. And so, where where is that demand going to come from? So, it looks like the demand for uh, saw timber trees in hardwoods are, are going to sustain. The demand for pine saw timber are going to continue to improve. But how do we deal with that uh, intermediate product ahead of time? That's going to be the big question in, in forest management going forward. Uh, lastly, we are forming a wood innovation team. Um, myself, along with uh, uh, Tedrick Ratcliffe and other members at MFA, and this team will be uh, put together in order to address these very topics and to try to entice businesses other than just pine sawmills, which of course we want, but uh, we we'll try to get a whole cluster of different types of uh, businesses within the industry that can all benefit from, from being you know, around each other, right? A sawmill needs a pulp mill or someplace to send its residuals. A pulp mill likes to have those residuals as a, uh, you know, a substitute for round wood pulp wood. Um, and those, those things, while technology innovations may alter them some, they don't really change all that much or haven't in the last 20 or 30 years. And so we really need to, to figure out how to be holistic in, in keeping our industry healthy. And that, that team is, is going to uh, broach those, those subjects. Uh, another big area that I focus on are economic impacts and contributions from a, from a extension standpoint. We've produced the, myself and Mark Mazels have produced the county forestry contribution profiles and using the most updated uh, economic data. We've now got those published online. You can see a, a link there for the statewide uh, publication, but every county either is already up or is in the process of being put up. I've seen about 25 as of yesterday. Um, so uh, if you're interested in, in that information for your county, please contact me or you can look on the website uh, under that link. Also interested in things like uh, uh, impacts of, of disease and insect vectors. So I'm looking at uh, things like Chinese tallow, again, with uh, Dr. Eric McConnell and some members uh, for, uh, 
uh, faculty at uh, Louisiana Tech. Um, also working on a project on looking at the consulting foresters' contribution to the Mississippi economy, obviously particularly with an emphasis in forestry. Uh, and we're working in conjunction myself, Dr. Eric McConnell and Dr. Alan Bearfield are working on that project currently. Uh, last year, I also submitted a, a presentation, gave a presentation on the economic impacts of a wood mill closure. Uh, and that was the Port Hudson mill that closed in 2019, or at least closed its uh, the hardwood uh, portion that it was taking. <laughs> but the reason I did that, again, why it matters here, right? That's a Louisiana mill. Of course, that mill did have a lot of impact on Mississippi as well, but ultimately going forward when a mill closes, how can we do a very quick analysis to determine what the impact will be uh, from that closure? And we've been able to parse it out now to where we can look at the impacts both on landowners as well as on the overall uh, logging uh, landowner supply chain. And you can see the other publication we produced there, uh, impacts for uh, hardwood uh, receipts following an emerald ash borer invasion. Again, it doesn't, it's not for Mississippi specifically, but we can rerun these analyses as they become prescient uh, to stakeholders uh, uh, any time. Um, we now have the methodology and the, the data sets and figured out how to do that. And the next thing we're going to be working on is going to look at uh, uh, when a hurricane or a tornado impact hits. How do we get a really quick rapid response of, you know, with the wood that was knocked down um, and what we think about the health going forward? What's the economic impact along that, that supply chain uh, uh, from those events? So really we want to get to where all these important events that occur in forestry, we're able to provide economic numbers to stakeholders, to congressmen, both state and federal, for disaster relief, for policy planning, all of these things uh, that, that make these numbers valuable. Uh, transportation, this was another topic that was brought up at, at last year's meeting. You can see the quote there. Uh, from our, our notes from our, our uh, PAC advisory uh, meeting. And I'm currently working with Drs. Uh, Robert Gralla, Dr. Zarek McConnell, and a uh, member of transportation, uh, Dr. Mohammed Marufazan. And we're going to, uh, we've got a, a grant pro a project submitted to uh, uh, the U.S. Forest Service looking at log truck routing costs due to bridge closures in Mississippi. And what we want to be able to do with that data is prioritize which bridges are affecting uh, the, the forestry supply chain the most and be able to better target, you know, the limited funds that they have for fixing bridge closures or road uh, damage, things like that. It's not just bridge closures, uh, road damages, anything that's, that's creating uh, a longer routes to the mill. As you might know, when it comes to cost to, to the mill, uh, you know, routing costs are really uh, a, a big, uh, you know, one of the biggest ticket items. And while we can't get our industry closer to Dallas or Houston or Atlanta, uh, we can get more efficient in getting our wood from the forest to the mills. And that's really what this project uh, aims to aims to focus focus in on. Uh, another request was for. Uh, information and studies on mixed species planning, mechanical treatments, and thinning regimes. And you can see there, I've, I've added uh, uh, all the topics that I worked on this past year that kind of kind of fell within that, that broad category that, that the PAC, PAC Council had uh, recommended. Um, also looking now currently at more thinning regimes, uh, but for the mixed species planning and the mechanical treatments, you can you can see there the 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 work that I've I've done that would that would be most relevant uh, to those questions. There all are also, also uh, other presentations and publications that that uh, 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 that go that kind of augment what I've got here, right? That kind of are sister publications, for lack of a better term. And so, if you are interested in any of these topics, even if it's not something specific to this, we do have things that uh, are related on mixed stands. So uh, broader things like silviculture within mixed stands, uh, some of the uh, silvics behind the uh, early competition and pre-commercial thinning, um, 
along those those topic lines. So if those are where your interests lie, please reach out to me and, and I'll get you those those documents and or presentations. Another topic that was of interest to the uh, uh, PAC at the PAC meeting last time were uh, was this issue that uh, landowners have been waiting for years to get inspections from American Tree Farm. Now, again, uh, there, while there has been this with a little bit of a withdrawal because of funding from state agencies in order to help landowners do this, you have seen a, a bigger push from uh, companies, uh, both both pulpwood size, you know, mills as well as sawmills, with a greater interest in uh, their wood supplies being, you know, being able to point to and say that they're sustainable, and obviously certification is the the kind of the gold standard for doing that. And uh, I miss, uh, sorry about the misspelling there, but uh, Inviva now has a program uh, that will write management plans and enroll landowners in these systems. Um, and you can see the link below in order to uh, reach out to them in order to do that. So that's not gonna solve the problem in totality, um, but it is one more outlet that would allow people to get registered and again, as far as uh, follow-ups and things like that, I'd have to do a little more digging to see what their, uh, you know, what their, what their plan is for doing that. But obviously, they want to enroll people and they want people to stay enrolled. So I would imagine that there is a, a good bit of uh, uh, resources that'll be devoted toward any of those uh, uh, updates for inspection, things like that, on the properties. Uh, without, you know, without belaboring it, one of the big issues that we faced in, in uh, 2020 was, was COVID-19. I can't, it's sort of an understatement saying it like that, but you can really see here at the end of this graph, right, what happened with lumber prices and what happened with saw timber prices. And kind of surprisingly, uh, with housing starts, we, we suspected that those housing starts were going to go go down just due to a, a fear of the job security and things like that. But the counter to that was that uh, interest rates went so low that um, the expectations from the uh, sawmill sector specifically that uh, housing starts were going to go down. They started to mothball a lot of their operations temporarily, right, reduce capacity those things and they got blindsided, many of them, and the demand went through the roof. Um, a lot of you may not know this, but 60% of all uh, uh, two by fours that are, uh, that are pine uh, go to decking. And that always is a number that astounds people, but you can imagine with people working at home, wanting to do their do-it-yourself projects that they've been postponing, there was a mad rush at uh, the Lowe's and the Home Depots of the world. And we really had a shortage uh, of lumber for a good period of time. And while the, those, have, those kinks have kind of since worked themselves out, um, could it happen again? Uh, yes, it could if we have another round of COVID. I think you will see a much more uh, muted impact because companies are going to look at what happened last time and say, well, hey, you know, prices shot through the roof. Let's just keep, let's keep on uh, producing lumber. Um, that, that, that may be a flawed logic though, because how many more do-it-yourself projects are there? Um, we may have gotten the majority of them. So while people may react to what happened before, they may be reacting the wrong way because that demand that was there may not be. So it'll be an interesting economic question about what happens. Uh, long term, though, with those mills coming online, as I mentioned uh, previously, I would expect uh, this. I would expect those record highs that we've seen, or close to record highs we've seen in lumber prices, uh, to 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 come down quite a bit. Um, you won't see these as many radical spikes to the to those levels um, as those new mills come online. Certainly. Certainly what we're seeing in Mississippi has occurred uh, across the Southeast, but a lot of those mills that have been announced are still either being built or they're just coming online. 
So there's quite a bit of, of sawmill capacity that's going to be here in, in about two or three years uh, that's not here right now. If you want to read more on that document, there's the link, um, and it covers economic impacts for uh, a lot of different food and ag markets, not just forestry. Um, also related to COVID-19, I did an in-service training uh, for uh, uh, county agents on the updated information in the CARES Act legislation for the tax code. And if you're interested in that information, I can provide it as well. But uh, quite a bit of uh, quite a bit of uh, uh, tax breaks for people either wanting to pull money from their uh, retirement account without a penalty, or um, or reduced penalties. And uh, certainly, if you're a business, uh, carry loss, carry forward, uh, net operating losses, and those sorts of things. Those have been really those rules have been really relaxed, which you know, they, they really had to had to be in order for people to, to stay afloat. Uh, another one, another question I got at the last PAC meeting was this Longleaf uh, or Loblolly kind of financial comparisons. And as you know, you know, Loblolly is the most commercially viable pine species. It's, it's the one that's uh, the most versatile amongst the, the, the four major pines. I guess you could really say five, but really four in this state. Um, it's the most versatile, and it's the most commercially viable, it's the one that most people have planted. Um, but there's been a big push, especially in our neck of the woods, to, you know, one thing, uh, should I even be growing pine trees? Should I grow hardwoods? And kind of within that same conversation has been, well, you know, once I finally do harvest, do I really want to replant loblolly or do I want to replant longleaf? And this is the best area for it. And if you look at the uh, natural history maps, um, sort of the traditional range, you know, this the southeast region is right in the heart of longleaf territory. And, you know, as a result, it has some attributes that Loblolly doesn't have, uh, or doesn't, the attributes aren't as strong that make it more attractive. It's, it's more ro ro uh, robust to uh, uh, most uh, insect and disease outbreaks vec and vectors. Um, holds up better in, in uh, hurricane damage uh, and, you know, high winds uh, for that matter generally, which given last year's activity would probably be of interest to people. Um, the problem has always been that Loblolly, even though the prices have been muted so much, because Longleaf takes so much longer to grow and because I have those establishment costs that I carry over the life of my investment, it still didn't seem in most cases to be a preferred, from a financial standpoint, a preferred outcome. But you did get a lot of non-market benefits um, in terms of wildlife and things like that. It's, it's aesthetically more pleasing to many landowners. So there were always, always those benefits, but you still wanna try to get the financials close in order to put Longleaf over the top um, and so that those other attributes that you're interested in um, kind of are just the cherry on top, so to speak. Now, did an analysis, and we are working this into an extension pub, uh, but there is uh, a little bit of a write-up on it in our, our Overstory Volume 9 Issue 2 from last year in September. But I've continued to work on it, and while none of the uh, cost share outcomes overcome Loblolly uh, with respect to, to Longleaf, until you get to equip options, um, you're better off using, using Loblolly from a purely financial standpoint. But when we do get to those equip dollars, um, then we actually see, and you can see there on that graph there, I have the best Loblolly outcomes versus the uh, Longleaf with the equip money. And what the equip money basically does is uh, drive your establishment cost to near zero and even though you're growing on a much longer rotation, you are getting more uh, uh, pole volume. So that's a higher, you know, it's another product class that's valued much more highly than, than saw timber. But those, you know, those long periods of time that you're carrying your establishment cost, even though they're still there, they're so small that you can afford to carry it longer. And in fact, not only can you afford to, it's a preferred option. And so if you're interested in that, that program, that equip program, and what it entails, please, you know, get in touch with me. Um, there's, they're really, they're really getting aggressive, uh, both at the state and the federal level, 
to get people into the long these long leaf, uh, you know, into planting long leaf. And so the financial benefits are, are really there right now. Uh, we also did an in-service for our county agents that uh, influences or affects uh, stakeholders within, uh, this, you know, the southeastern region. So we basically did a, a a timber stand management 101. So things that you kind of need to know when you, as a county agent, when you go out onto a timber stand, does the stand need to be thinned? How do you tell? Um, you know, all those things. And that was a program that we co-taught with uh, Butch Bailey and Dr. James Henderson, my, my boss down here. And uh, Butch is, is a county agent uh, housed up in the Hattiesburg area, very knowledgeable forester. Many of you know him. And uh, that program went over very well. It also allowed us to get a needs assessment from our county agents in the region for topics going forward. So we'll be utilizing that to help them better help you and uh, obviously we're, um, you know, Butch and I are always available to you for uh, uh, consultation, personal questions uh, related to your timber property. But we also want to build the capacity for expertise to help you. And that's what we're really trying to do with these in-service trainings. And that's really one of the missions by our, uh, you know, the extension uh, head honcho, Dr. Gary Jackson, is that, uh, we want county agents to be able to field, you know, some of the basic questions in these uh, specialized topic areas. And because a lot of them don't have forestry degrees, uh, it falls to people like Butch, myself, and James to, uh, you know, get, 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 those, get their chops built up for, for this material. But they, the agents were very, uh, uh, very, very fun to work with. They really had a great attitude and really seemed interested in learning the material. So I think we've got we're on to something there. I think we'll we'll have have some more more fun uh, uh, workshops with them and, and educational opportunities going forward. Uh, with that, I will I'll wrap it up and, and say thank you for uh, listening to me and I hope you you found some value in the presentation. And um, I didn't cover every single thing that we've done. There were more topics. I thought these were the most relevant uh, and would be of the most interest to the the pack group. Um, and I will continue to go through those uh, uh, bullet points from last year and try to address all those topic areas that uh, landowners either want uh, presentations on, information on, uh, publications. Uh, you guys really act as, as one of my major needs assessments uh, throughout the year. And I have one from my county agents, but I need one from you guys. And I have quite a bit for my tax program. But the more, but you know, that's my statewide responsibilities. When it comes to my regional responsibilities, uh, help me to kind of, you know, uh, steer in the direction that you want me to steer in, and uh, that way we can get the questions answered that you want to have answered. And uh, that's really what my goal is here to do. Um, if you want, uh, please contact me by email or by phone uh, at the at the following uh, uh, connections there that I've left. And uh, if you have any questions about specific things I've presented in the presentation or things that weren't in the presentation, I'm happy to you know, field those questions and look forward to speaking with you here in the future. And uh, with that, I will uh, end the presentation and say thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you again later.